Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Welcome to the first episode of Backyard Philosophy. This is Nick and Mike on the other side. We're talking about invasive species today. Uh, we're going to start off with the definition of an invasive species is a organism that's been moved to another area it isn't or native to, which is pretty simple. What that means is, say for example, a plant that lived in Japan, Europe, anywhere, and now resides in the United States. The, probably the most common invasive species are zebra mussels, kudzu vines in the south, scotch broom out west, and uh, the carp also in the Midwest. Um, so we want to talk about the difference, start off between an invasive species and a naturalized species. So an invasive species is a species that comes in and causes harm to the ecosystem and the environment. Whereas a naturalized species is able to fill a niche and kind of slip in and you don't, it's not taking over vast sections of habitat. It's just kind of filling a role that wasn't there before. And if you didn't know any better, you would think that it was native. Um, a good example would be cutthroat trout in Eastern Idaho, where they are non-native to the area, but they fit right in. Uh, they push out some more native trout but they're not completely dominating the ecosystem. Uh, I work in in the woods. I'm a forester for a private timber company, so I, a lot of my job is dealing with invasive species. So I have a background in that. Mike, why don't uh, you tell them a little, a little bit about your background in invasive species or what you found out? I was super excited doing research on invasive species because pretty much everything I know from invasive species was middle school and high school and doing little volunteer work to clean up like honeysuckle and, or like clean up some weird plants in my backyard but nothing like I knew they were bad but as an engineer and I and this, and like I always went towards the science world and I didn't really think much with the nature of the world and I it's not really something I come across very often with invasive species especially because I deal with more machinery and plastics and metals so when researching about invasive species holy crap that blew my mind on so many there's just so many topics I'm gonna be so excited to talk about and I'm very happy to talk about it with Nick who's got he's gonna hold my hand a little bit going through the invasive species uh, I mainly, I kind of broke it down because there's a lot of invasive species all throughout the world. Many countries deal with it. I did some research on uh, six different species here in the United States that are affecting two water, two land, and two plant life. And it's just amazing on the ripple effect invasive species have on every business and the economy and people's lives. And I don't know, you mentioned it, Nick, about Asian carp, and I would love to start talking about Asian carp. Yeah, let's go down the Asian carp pole. I'm a big, big fisherman. I love watching all those videos, and people catch them on the fly, and it seems pretty fun, but yeah, they, they're they doing a number. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Asian carp kind of hold dear to me and Nick, because we are both grew up in the Chicagoland area, and the Asian carp have evaded the Mississippi River, and they're trying very hard to get into the Great Lakes especially like Michigan, which is kind of the stopping point from them getting out and destroying entire ecosystems. So Asian carp were almost in our backyard, uh, so to speak. But uh, when I was doing research on Asian carp and all the invasive species in general, I can't, I didn't realize how many invasive species were brought here on purpose, thinking it would be a solution to a problem. Like, for example, the Asian carp were originally introduced to help water lakes and ponds because they're bottom feeders. And uh, it just, lack of care, one night it flooded, and the flood led the Asian carp into the Mississippi River, and they just took over. Like, they're 
in Ohio River, Illinois River, all up and down the Mississippi River, and they are just decimating every every type of species there. Yeah, I think that's going to be a common theme is human introduction of these species. And just a common theme in general is, is this podcast is going to be things we thought at the time that are completely untrue. Um, and now that we have more science, more data, we're going back and finding out that things we did in the past are really detrimental. But that you know that's what makes the human race the human race. We're going to learn from mistakes and keep moving on. Yeah, I mean, pushing forward with species and fixing the problems history has created, I'm hoping we pause a little bit and uh, start going through invasive species. Because, uh, like, I know with a lot of invasive predators, especially the Asian carp, they have no natural predator. They get so big that nothing can happen. It, it's getting so bad, like, human intervention is, like, the only way to solve it. And I know back in the in 2010, the government spent $78.5 million dollars just to prevent uh, Great Lakes from getting infected with Asian carp. That's a lot of money. And that's just that's just prevention from getting to the Great Lakes, not solving the problem, just prevention. Yeah, so things that make an invasive species uh, invasive and damage the ecology is they don't have predators. That's called the predator exclusion. It's the same reason why if you grow a, a Douglas fir in say New Zealand where there's no diseases or pests it's going to grow a lot better than in its native habitat and uh, all those invasive species that spread and they don't have predators they're taking away some kind they're eating something they're consuming something whether it be a plant consuming light resources then the carp consuming bottom feeder there's other natural fish natural plankton that eats that same substance that uh isn't getting that and it's being pushed out of its natural habitat by this invasive species that we brought over and be when uh sorry to interrupt you there but i i can't help but bring up some stories when i was researching on asian carp that i just find absolutely hilarious like a bunch of the uh, invasive species that i uh researched just some ridiculous solutions that made things far worse or that are just funny to me one of them being we're using electric fences as barriers like as dams and uh it doesn't just kill asian carp it kills everything that touches it like it is a full-on electrocution to anything that comes near it or uh they tried using poison uh like back in 2010 uh, some type of carpicide, and when they released it, it uh, I'm sorry, it was a highly toxic uh, bromine pot, uh, pesticide. And the funny thing is, it killed a lot of things, but it was all native fish. It didn't kill any Asian carp. So they dumped a bunch of poisons trying to kill the Asian carp, did not kill one, and just killed all the native species. Well, you got to start somewhere, but uh, yeah, those are some tough fish. I know some friends down in, um, down south of me and they'll bow fish for the carp and they're using hundred pound braided line with like 50 pound draw bows because you, it, their skin is so tough Jesus. that just a normal bow is not going to pierce it. And then even after they get hit, they need that 100-pound braided line because pretty much anything less than that, they can break it off, wrap it around, swim deeper, and get out of it. They're just such tough fish. They're monsters. Have you ever gone fishing for one of them? No, I've never gone fishing for them. You know, I've, I've seen them there, and I, I've watched a ton of videos of people catching them. I just, I always thought of carp as uh, kind of like little, like below catfish. I mean, just junk fish. There was no reason to catch them, but... Now, after YouTube and stuff, and I can watch everyone catching them on these videos, they put up a hell of a fight and be a good time. Yeah, I know uh, some restaurants are even serving uh, Asian carp. And for those who don't know, uh, the invasive species of Asian carp in the Mississippi rivers, there's four different types. Uh, I know black and silver are one type. I can't remember the other two. Uh, some of them you can eat. Uh, restaurants are coming up with ways so to cook them and eat them. But the others are such bottom feeders that they don't taste good at all but a total eradication is the end goal of this invasive species 
And uh, another fun fact about these Asian carp is how sensitive they are to sound. Y'all probably seen it on YouTube, like uh, a boat driving by and all these fish just jumping out of the water or hitting someone on the boat. That's usually the Asian carp. They're so sensitive to sound that boat motors can make them jump out of the water. Uh, some scientists are even trying to do sound barriers because since the Asian carp are so sensitive to sound, the Asian carp can, can't go through. They're repelled by the sound, but native fish like catfish and sunfish can swim on through without being repelled back. And it's from the small test they had, it was a 95% success rate. But it cost about a half a million dollars to make. So a little expensive to do that. Well, I think you're leading into something here. I think now's a good time to talk about the economic effects of some of these invasive species. Like you mentioned the carp jumping out of water. And some people go out and, you know, they'll catch those fish and they'll be put on catcher's gear. And, you know, like you said, you've seen the YouTube videos. But for most people who just want to go out and tube, water ski, fish, you know, that prevents a barrier. And people aren't going to come to an area to do that that often compared to people fishing i mean the great lakes tourism is a is a pretty big business and all around that with the asian carp disrupting that tourism you're losing tourism dollars so even if you don't think the asian carp is isn't affecting you in that area because you don't fish or you don't go to the lake in some small part it's probably playing a pretty decent role in your life yeah i was i so I can't help as an engineer of try to come up with some solutions for problems. And uh, one of them was with the sound is kind of make a game out of it. If you can use sound to make them jump, maybe you could try to get some giant nets and catch them and whoever catches most. Because I know a, for a lot of invasive species, and as we get more into the podcast and start talking about different invasive species, a lot of countries and states are making contests out of it to just simply remove the invasive species. But I wanted to run a solution by you, Nick, that I had a, actually, I had a little personal experience with uh, invasive species. So I went to school at Southern Illinois University, SIU. And when I went to school there, our lakes got infected with red algae. And they tried using chemicals. They tried introducing, I want to, I want to say it was some organic material, maybe a different type of algae, algae to fight it. But they had no success. Their only solution was to drain the entire lakes and then re remove all the red algae and then re-pump the water back in. And I was just wondering if it's a viable option to section off part of the Mississippi River, drain it, kill all the Asian carp, reflood it in, save the native species, and just do that section by section by section. I know it would be expensive and crazy, but is that a solution, you think? Well, you know, not my area of expertise, but... I think the problem is with a lot of these invasive species and even just species that are naturalized but due to climate change are becoming a large issue like bark beetles is that we need to start looking at crazier solutions. I mean, right now there's bark beetles destroying Canada's uh, alder wood, their wood reserves. They're just sweeping through. And when they hit the U.S. and they're going to be able to reproduce longer, because it's going to be warmer, so their reproduction cycle can be longer. So instead of reproducing twice a year, they can reproduce three times. Their population can increase exponentially due to warm weather. And the problem with that, that your solution is the same problem all these other large-scale solutions have, is getting multiple landowners to work together for a common goal. You have multiple landowners, even though, at least out west, the state owns the water, so they can do pretty much with it what they want. And they have to work through some federal red tape, just like anything. But you're going to have to get those landowners on the side because you're going to have to go on their property. You're going to do things, you know, with them. And I think the biggest problem there isn't that it, it wouldn't work because you're going to need to go to extreme lengths if you want to remove these invasive species because they're they get in and it's it's impossible to get them out. I mean, it, some days it seems like half my job is just fighting invasive species. But it's not that can we do it, it's that can you get the landowners to work with you? Yeah, I agree, I agree with you completely. This is definitely, invasive species is definitely a community problem where we all kind of got to agree to work together to get rid of this because, say, Bill 
uh, one neighbor has this problem and he decides to let people come and remove the invasive species, but say Ted right next door to him doesn't allow it, well, they're just going to come back. But speaking of crazy ideas, I got a couple crazy ideas for you for uh, for the Asian carp. So in case you all don't know what a bull shark is, it is a shark type of shark that lives a lot in the Caribbean, but it's also not just a saltwater shark. It can also survive in freshwater, and it has been found all the way in the Great Lakes of Michigan. So I'm wondering, do we introduce bull sharks into the Mississippi River and make things a little more interesting for the Asian carp? Yeah, you might not be able to swim, but no Asian carp and sharks in the water. As a, a fisherman, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna say we do that. That does bring me to an interesting question that I brought up while we were uh, while I was researching: is is it ethical to move a species that's eh, bull shark's not the best example, but is considered endangered or for some reason to a new habitat that it's going to thrive in? And so, what you're talking about is introducing it on purpose and the uh what department is it i forget but uh some federal department it, i think it might be customs they do what's called they do a bunch of trials so for example we have an invasive species out here called gorse um and it's basically a spiky oily plant and the problem for for those who don't know nick why don't you tell us a little bit about the area you work in so I'm uh, what part of the United States. I work on the southern Oregon coast, just above California, and four hours south of southwest of Portland, um, out in rural Oregon. So that's kind of where where I'm at, and we have our. It's it's just a great place to grow trees. Don't come and visit. Um, <laughs> no reason for that. But what I'm saying is so. They, they do all these studies to determine, okay, so we have an invasive species, and why is it doing so well? Well, like we stated previously, it has no natural predators. So why don't we just bring those predators here? Well, there's a lot of questions that go into that. So one is, if we bring those predators there, are they only going to kill our invasive species that we're trying to get rid of, or are they just going to also destroy the native habitat, and instead of having one invasive species, we have two? So what they'll do is they'll have these big glass habitats. So depending on the species, it could be really big or really small. It, it all depends. And they'll just release them in there with some of our native species and just see what happens. So so they're telling me they have giant aquariums. I did, I did not research or fit, find, come across this at all. They have giant aquariums to run tests on introducing invasive species into different habitats. Yeah, basically. I mean, this is mostly for uh, like bugs and plant issues. I I don't really deal too much with water, so I can't determine that. But yeah, they have big glass containers, and they just observe uh, what's going to happen. And so they'll just put a natural like their species in there. Say they want to bring in I don't know some moth or something from Asia that is a natural. So what the, what the one by us is gorse, like I was saying. And there's a spider that it weaves really thick webs and it kills the gorse plants. And the webs are so thick, it doesn't allow any sunlight to penetrate it. So the gorse plants die. Oh, Jesus. And so they, yeah. So what they did was they tested it. And this is the problem with, with testing is it's not 100% certain. And so they tested it and it seems like the spiders wouldn't have too much of an effect on native habitat. Well, the spiders did a really good job of keeping the gorse plants out, but they also kept every other plant out, and uh, now we can't get rid of the spiders. Well, that's a nightmare. That's that's grab the flamethrower and just start over again. Yeah. So it's it's but that it's only on like a few hundred feet of land, and they're very pretty much contained. We just can't com seem to get completely rid of them, but it's just it's such a small area. It's that's the only area they introduced them. It was it was just a trial run, so they're they're probably getting a handle on it and they're going to get rid of those spiders. But that was uh, it worked in the test and it didn't work. But they are testing to see what species can kill the species that bring in because 
all these species came from somewhere and they do have predators wherever they well, came that's from. that's why I thought the bull shark was an interesting thing because we've already seen what happens when bull sharks are in the Mississippi and Great Lakes. They can't survive the cold, so when cold comes, they either go down the Mississippi back into the Gulf or they die. So it, it's more they're more like a seasonal plant, but it's a shark. Some I came across some research that they are native to parts of the Mississippi River, but not the entire Mississippi River, and that is alligator gar. So a big problem with the Asian carp is. Uh, Lots of fish eat them when they're juvenile fish. But once they become adulthood, they're too big and nothing can touch them. But alligator gar, especially, uh, I want to give a shout out to the short-nosed alligator gar, tends to be a little bit more aggressive towards Asian carp than any other alligator gar. So I've actually fished alligator gar before, and I don't, I wouldn't mind fishing that again. And I couldn't see a really a problem putting that in the Mississippi River up and down. Hopefully we could breed the alligator gar to be a little bit more aggressive towards Asian carp. Because some of these Asian carp, I don't know if you all have seen pictures of it, but they get big. Yeah, they're 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 a really decent sized fish. Now I know I don't know about the the carp, but I do know so down south in Florida or Caribbean, the uh lionfish is a pretty big problem. And they keep trying to get native fish to eat the lionfish. And so they would do things like kill lionfish and leave them out. But all that did was train the native fish to just follow divers around because they knew their next meal was coming. It never trained them to actually kill the lionfish. It just trained them to follow the divers. Oh, Nick, I I love you. Because guess what other aquatic animal I studied? The lionfish. The lionfish is just... This is lionfish are a world problem. I, I don't know if you mind if we switch to lionfish over Asian carp, unless you got some more stuff to talk about Asian carp. No, we're good. Uh, lionfish probably one of the first invasive species I've killed, just like because it was invasive. Definitely not the last in my line of work, but definitely the most fun. <laughs> I just can't believe they're in the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, all up and down the West Atlantic, found all the way as far north as New York City. And now they're taking over the Mediterranean Sea. And it is just, just Florida, F- Florida, in case you all don't know, has a lots of invasive species problems. Florida, I think, is, in my opinion, might be hit the hardest with all the invasive species. <laughs> Florida also just has a lot of problems, but that's just a per Florida thing. <laughs> Maybe that is just a Florida thing. <laughs> but... Uh, the problem with the lionfish is they eat lots of herbivores and crustaceans, so if they just destroy they just destroy the ecosystem of plants of other fish that would eat algae. So the lionfish come in, eat all the small fish that normally eat algae, and then the algae just runs rampant and just offsets the ecosystem, destroys natural reefs, and the natural ecosystem can't keep up because an adult lionfish can reproduce at the same time as most native fish there about 79 percent faster yeah it's not uncommon for lionfish to have 2,000 oh yeah it is ridiculous and they can since the water is so warm they can reproduce all year round and because of the ocean currents uh i don't know i'm not sure if it's the same where native lionfish are in in southeast asia but i know in the atlantic is they just let their eggs into the ocean current so the eggs travel wherever the water takes them and then they're just born and then they just start going they uh scientists estimate because of this the fish population of a million square miles of ocean is populated with lionfish every 10 years that's pretty crazy and for those of you who don't think your life has an effect on this earth mike do you know how the lionfish population started out out here at least i don't know Lionfish were in someone's aquarium during a hurricane, and the hurricane came through, busted the house, busted the aquarium open. Next thing you know, lionfish are living out in the reefs. One or two aquariums, that's all it took. Talk about life finds a way, but sometimes you wish life wouldn't find a way. But hey, you hunted lionfish. Did you eat the lionfish? Because I know they are edible. Yeah, so we sure did. Um, So we went out with the diving down somewhere in the Caribbean 
and we speared lionfish with just a just a spear gun i mean we it's pretty simple we made one at home and you the thing is you put the lionfish in this pvc carrying crate basically because they're uh i don't know what you call them stingers or spines or spines are extremely venomous like they're not going to kill you but you're going to feel it and you're not going to have a good time so we went diving and we killed a bunch and then the dive instructor the guide showed us how to clean them and keep all the venom out of the meat and keep yourself more importantly keep yourself from getting uh stung and so we we ate it and it was good but the problem is there's so many other fish to catch out there that uh you know if you're a local you know and you're looking to catch some food you're going to catch something else so you don't have to worry about you know getting stung over and that's the same thing with the fish they didn't seem to they don't care about the lionfish but as soon as you come in and to start cleaning it they know what's going on and they'll pick up the scraps but they're not going to go out and kill those things because they're they do have that defense mechanism yeah i i read a lot that sharks don't go after lionfish leave healthy lionfish they tend to only go after injured or sick lionfish but it does pop in my mind is there anything we can use their venom for because i know some venom is used for like cancer research or uh, uh medicine and i don't know what kind of neurotoxin or it could be a neurotoxin it could be some poison or venomous i'm not sure what their spikes are it's just something to think about i don't know if you happen to know anything about that yeah i have no idea what their poison is used for all i know is uh we killed a few and we thought it was fun but uh we also didn't want to put too much blood in the water and have some shark try and kill us so <laughs> No, we don't want to lose you, Nick. Not yet. Not yet. Not until I'm in the will. But uh, for that's a big thing. Is uh, I'm happy you did that because from what I understand is lionfish, the only way they're really removed is human intervention. Uh, they tried adding traps, but uh, in case you all didn't know, lionfish can swim to very deep depths where it's really hard for divers to find lionfish. My favorite, uh, my favorite, this is way back. This is, this is how I knew, like this is, back when I was in high school, so like 10 years ago. Uh, one of my favorite stories is a Florida man modified his Glock to shoot underneath water to kill lionfish. And when Florida told him he can't do that, Florida, it used that you need permits to hunt lionfish. I'm not sure if anymore or different regions, you need permits and registration to hunt lionfish. But his solution was simply go a little bit farther out in the water and be in international water and no longer in florida water which i just loved now i know you said life will find a way but this story just proves florida man will find a way oh man florida florida is like putting bull in china shop someone's something bound to happen yeah that's a big i, I don't know i it's a big problem though is that a lot of times you know the thing with invasive species is if you find a new one you got to act quick and you got to act fast i mean the the federal the feds have a system of early detection rapid response which is what they tout however they're it seems to be early detection late response is uh kind of from what i see and this is this needs to be a, a quick response if you want to actually deal with these species you know having lionfish protect doesn't make any sense and they protect other invasive species and maybe for good reason maybe not but you know we got to if it's not for a good reason, you got to explain why it's going on and why we need to have a permit to kill an invasive species. I mean, if the objective is to remove it, why do we have to pay to do that? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure for most invasive species now in the United States, or at least the ones I research, which is like five or six, you don't need permits anymore. It is free game. Because I know in uh, 2018, Florida had a tournament of hunting which is like the most a person can grab and they ended up killing 15 or 16,000 within like a week and they gave away prizes like money i think it might have been lionfish or a different invasive species but they someone gave away a car it is a war invasive species is a war that unfortunately most countries are losing oh yeah no don't get me wrong i mean we're all losing invasive species war but like in oregon you know pike minnow they eat salmon eggs and they're invasive the state pays you to fish for them, but you still need to have a fishing license to fish for them. 
Uh, and that's a small step, and most people who do fish for pikemen are going to have a fishing license. But it's just, it's kind of weird to me that it, if you really want this gone, maybe make this something that you don't have to pay to, to fish for. It's just anyone can do it. Free labor. That that sounds like a very easy way to at least help some of the rangers or help some of the organizations remove invasive species. I'm definitely down for that. But I did find it interesting because they have some traps for the deep waters, but they're having a hard time finding a bait that attracts lionfish. Apparently, they haven't found a bait that works on lionfish, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, but at the same time, I fish for a lot of fish all the time, and I can't find a bait that works all the time. So I don't think that's something you can you can get. I mean... Well, I was I was thinking we kind of add more of a scientific approach to it, and we genetically engineer bait towards a species. Because with CRISPR and different genetic edit- editing software, we could start targeting invasive species a little bit more directly, I think. Which I think a great stop would be would be bait, because we're not introducing a new food source. We're not introdu- modifying any existing animals. Like, uh, going back to the Asian carp, uh, I know... The Asian carp tend to eat uh, zooplankton a lot, and I was wondering if we introduced a zooplankton that was modified to be poisonous to Asian carp, but changing a food source seems dangerous to me, but maybe editing and making a bacteria, not bacteria, a bait for lionfish might be a better solution. Yeah, well, you know, the thing that when we kill the lionfish, just like any other fish, you know, fishermen are curious people. You cut up its stomach to see what it's eating. A lot of times, just very small fish. So my guess, just uneducated guess, not a lionfish expert, I would engineer a bait fish that is slow and lethargic and easily drawn t- to like bright colors. Because the lionfish basically just sit there and they use their fins to basically in scarf. They just wrap it around the fish and push it into their mouth. So any fish that's super fast can get away from easily they like the easy prey i mean just like any other animal they're going to go after the easiest meal they can get i mean even humans we're going to go to mcdonald's over a five-star restaurant you have to sit down if we're in a hurry and in nature being in a hurry means you're using your resources if you're sitting there using resources you're not going to last long but if you can stock up those resources you're going to survive a lot longer yeah that makes complete sense to me since you cut up and saw a bunch of small fish how could you specify more on like how you would use that to your advantage like you said they're going after the small fish they're engulfing it and they're going after the easy fish but would we just have the smaller fish in in cages that would be a one-way trap for so line fish would go in and they couldn't come out going after the small fish but since they're sitting around like you said would they go after the traps no from what i've seen it looks like they're more ambush predators and the problem with Florida is it is a, it is a crazy wild state, but it's also so many bait fish. You got a ton of little bait fish. You got shrimp. There's just, it's almost like there's too many, even if we genetically engineered the perfect fish for those lionfish to catch, we still have the issue of there's so many other fish out there that I don't think we could monopolize their market just because it is such a such a nutrient rich ecosystem that you have a ton of food to eat there if you're a lionfish maybe i misspoke i wasn't talking about i talked about editing uh food for the asian carp but i was thinking just like modifying raw beef into a bait for the lionfish taking something non-living like stem cells and produce them into a meat that'd be targeted towards lionfish not taking already native species and making it harder or easier for lionfish to get. All right, I see what you're saying. So what you're looking for is scent. You know, fish smell just like humans do. Yes. You know, everyone talks about how sharks smell blood and whatnot. So yeah, you're gonna you're trying to breed for a scent. You could do that. I mean, the other thing is you could find a scent that the lionfish really like and just make sure to keep that in the bait. I mean, so like, for instance, crab, a lot of people will put uh, cat food uh, slightly open so that it just leaks that oily cat food scent in your crab pot. You know, I like to do, when I'm fishing for rockfish, I'll put some herring scent on my lures, and it seems to work sometimes, doesn't work other times, but yeah, if you, 
I guess if you, what you're saying is we need to find some scent that the lionfish can't resist that maybe other fish can resist, you know? And so what I'd focus on then is I'd go back to look at the Philippines where the lionfish are from and see what their natural, what their natural uh, prey is and try and recreate a scent that's very similar to that because hopefully it'll kick their instincts in and their instincts will say prey and they'll head towards that trap. I completely agree with that, except that when doing research on these lionfish, I've noticed that lionfish have changed from the Southeast Asia region to the Gulf Atlantic region. In the Southeast Asia region, they're nighttime fish. They're nocturnal. But now in the Gulf and the Atlantic, they're daytime fish. They've switched their cycles, and I'm not sure why. But If I had to guess, I'd say they have a natural daytime predator. And now that they don't have that daytime predator, they can operate during the day. That is a good point. Did not think of that. So maybe, maybe we find some sense that they like from their homeland. Maybe genetic engineer, or not genetic engineer, look at their DNA sequence to figure out what's triggering the lionfish's brain. Throw some biology in there. I'm not a biologist, mechanical engineer. Sorry, folks. Can't help you there. And make a bait and throw in the traps. Maybe make the conservation's life a little easier on inv- that invasive species. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, too, there's a lot of actual uh, companies who entirely specialize in making scents that attract fish. And, you know, if that'd probably be a pretty lucrative contract if they were the ones to make that lionfish scent they'd probably make some good money because you're not struggling with that problem just in the u.s all the caribbean struggling with it probably the gulf of mexico the whole like country there like that's and now the mediterranean it's gonna be some oh really yeah yeah so that's that's some good money there so i'm sure people are working on it as we speak so when researching on the lionfish i thought oh let's just you know use underwater drones and kill the fish Someone's already doing that. They uh, there's this robot called uh, developed by Robots in Service of the Environment, also known as Rise. They've made robot drones with electrical rods that go drive up and electrocute lionfish. I love this. Like speaking of the Caribbean, they're re- uh, the government of Bermuda has supposedly, not quite sure if this is true, has developed nearly 16 million different type of robots and variations to combat the lionfish because it's devastating because they're a big fishing country. It's devastating their workforce and uh, devastating their economy. But I just love the idea of autonomous underwater drones with electrical rods swimming around zapping lionfish to death. I don't know why. But I feel like I live in the future. You you have no idea how much of a dream that is of mine. I would love nothing more than for a bunch of robots to roam these Oregon mountains and just pull invasive species and just do it for free. I mean, we'd pay for the robots, but it'd be so easy. Like, it's just, it's, it's costs a lot of money to have people do it, but if you could put a payment on a robot and they're going to work for a certain amount of hours and it could pay off for itself. Uh, man, I mean, we could, we could restore this area to the way it looked like when Lewis and Clark came through. Oh, that's a dream. That sounds absolutely wonderful. You are right. But when I was researching on uh, invasive species, so folks, for those listening, I kind of break down my research into sections and for invasive species, I did two water animals, two land animals and two plant slash insect animals. Holy crap, Nick. Your job sucks. It is like a never-ending battle. I could not come up with any solutions or find any any solutions to remove invasive species plants. Like, it is just man work of going out there and getting your hands dirty, and that is all I could come up with. Yeah, so the thing about invasive species is, like, they're, they're here to stay. I mean, the ones that get introduced like i said scotch broom and, and gorse are probably our two biggest but scotch broom by far is our biggest enemy and we just can't get rid of it so we don't try to get rid of it we treat it so in areas that are we know it's there then we'll 
when we have a new unit or something where you know it thrives in disturbance so disturbance is any event that basically resets your natural clock a fire um, logging a disease it gets rid of your overstory it cuts all your big trees are gone and now you have your understory your shrubs and stuff coming through scotch broom not native to the u.s any type of disturbed soil burn soil a machine dirt bike truck drove over it exposed to bare mineral soil it's going to pop right up though the only good thing about scotch broom is it only produces seed after its third year so you have two years to kill it before it can produce seed the problem is once it's established it has such a huge seed bank much like the lionfish that it's pretty much there to stay i mean it's going to produce a seed bank that's going to live for the next you know over 50 years it's fireproof you can't burn it you can't kill it with herbicide the seed bank wait hold up it's fireproof yeah it's a pretty common theme with a lot of western species and some introduced species is it's called a like a serotonous cone for um, some trees where you actually need fire to break up the outside of the shit uh, the pine cone or the cone for it to release its seed it needs that fire because that fire means it, it senses that fire has come through and it breaks it doesn't sense it it breaks up the outer layer of the chemicals that are on the shell and then the seeds release but what that's telling the shell is your competitors are gone now it's your time to reproduce i always knew fires helped because i just figured because it was ash and just meant it was open territory now that you didn't have to compete as hard but i never knew the in depth of the system that plants have developed to be fireproof or fire resistant to grow after a fire oh well we could probably do a whole episode just on the fire in the ecosystem i mean it's fire is nature's herbicide every time we talk about fighting invasive species controlling habitat growth and you don't talk about fire as one of those things you're not talking the full picture fire is a natural part of every ecosystem no matter how old or how long it is fire has been a part of that ecosystem since before we got here do you have a japanese honeysuckle out by you no we just have japanese knotweed what is that it's just a kind of a shrubby plant very hard to kill i mean you it's one of those plants kind of like scotch broom where once it's there you just fight it through the years you're never going to really get rid of it oh wow speaking of plants though i i don't know what else to do besides get out there because like you said herbicides don't really work they're fire resistance my crazy idea would have been genetically engineer a bug to like the taste of that certain plant's leaf and let them loose but that's pandora's box right there yeah so out west like i said scotch broom huge problem my friends who are farmers fight scotch broom as a forester i fight scotch broom it thrives on disturbed soil and what is disturbed soil it's soil that's about to be planted for wheat it's soil that's about to be planted for trees it's about to be planted for potatoes every single thing scotch broom gets in there it's roadsides anything it's a huge problem and like so we don't like we talked about we don't get rid of it we can't i mean we could if we would but we can't what we do is we control it so we control scotch broom so we treat it so we kill it before we plant and then we go back and kill anything or treat anything that's survived so because it will overgrow overgrow your trees it will overgrow your wheat you know whatever you're growing if you don't get a control on scotch broom it can grow pretty much taller faster than anything you're growing because that's the nature of the beast so you were just the problem is you got to get a handle on it, you got to get a handle on it quick the other problem is it's pretty people like it it's got pretty white or no yellow flowers and everyone likes to look at them so what do people do they grow it and they grow it because it's pretty that hurts my head so much because people are doing the same thing with japanese honeysuckle when i was researching it i found more websites on how to grow and maintain japanese honeysuckle which is devastating the northeast like maine and new york and vermont a lot but the websites just kept 
showing on how to preserve this invasive species and it it was hurting my soul and i i'm not in that industry i can't imagine what you must feel like when you're driving by and you see someone growing the plant you are meant to destroy oh yeah it uh it gets me worked up just to uh, ask my fiance we have uh pampas grass which is another one and that's a very pretty species everyone grows it out here it's a very coastal kind of like county chesney vibe and species it looks nice but it's not supposed to be here but yeah my neighbors are growing some uh scotch broom I'm, they're not really growing it it's just kind of growing in because it grows in any area it can it's a very good at what it does it's an early secessional species and so what uh can you explain that for those who are listening so secession is the normal i guess rhythm of the environment so it basically means how is nature going to react so your first stage of secession so secession begins after disturbance disturbance logging fire disease uh windstorm basically anything that wipes out whatever was there and it can be it can, disturbances vary they can wipe out the entire ecosystem they can wipe out just a part they can wipe out an acre they can wipe out a hundred acres either or and so after this disturbance secession begins secession basically means rebuilding so what you're doing is your early secessional species your species that thrive on disturbance so any species that has a seed that's just sitting there waiting to see the sun as soon as it sits the sun it's going to pop right up some species adapt in different ways we can go way into depth on this some other time but scotch broom or other early secessional species they're ready to hit the dirt right as it opens up so they're looking for bare mineral soil disturbed soil they can get get in there before other species and they're quick to exploit that niche and a niche is basically just what role are you filling in that environment you give an inch they take a mile <laughs> so for example, like, um, say, trees, they fill the niche of, they take, you know, your, t they grow taller than other species. So they fill that niche of your, they grow up, take that, ox or not oxygen, take that light from everything else. Whereas, say, like, blackberry, which is a probably common invasive species by everyone, it's also a disturbance driven species. It'll grow in disturbed soil. So any soil that's seen some kind of disturbance. So that would mean, like, uh, you know, you're, you're tilled it or truck drove over it, made some big ruts, anything that exposes that bare mineral soil. When I say bare mineral soil, I'm just soil. You're not looking at grass. You're not looking at anything else sprouting up. You're just looking at dirt. Good old fashioned dirt patches. Hey, it's only dirt when it's inside. It's soil when it's outside. <laughs> Ah, uh, potato, potato. Soil is the lifeblood of this of everything, but that's. Uh, let's go with water. Right? Let's go with water for that one. Mm -hmm. Can do without either of them. Uh, pretty sure there are uh, there are live mammals and fish in water, and there's no soil in the water. Just saying. Yeah, but uh, what? Who uh, grows all that uh, foliage that they eat? The coral. All right, get out of here. <laughs> Come on, I'm a devil's advocate. I love playing devil's advocate. But I, I, I have a question with your plants. So when I was looking up the honeysuckle, I saw the ripple effect of not only is it killing trees and removing out normal plants, but the berries are very attractive to birds and different types of wildlife. And it's not healthy for these birds to eat it. Um, I couldn't find any research on if it's healthy for the native insects to eat it, but I know for the berries and birds, it's not great. Lots of birds tend to get sick from it. It's not doesn't sit well with them. And in case you guys don't remember from middle school, birds eat berries. They poop the berries, and new seeds form and new plants form. But I was wondering if your plants up in the northwest affect the mammals and animals in your area, like. Are those leaves heavily chewed upon a certain insect or, or uh, is it removing certain grasses that usually deer like to eat on or how, how is that affecting your ecosystem up there? Uh, so I would say our 
to me, our biggest competitor, if you're talking about ecosystem change, is going to be Himalayan blackberry. Now, we have a native blackberry, trailing blackberry. It's a small, it stays near the ground, and it produces berries similar to Himalayan blackberries. Himalayan blackberries is what everyone here knows and loves as blackberries. Big old juicy blackberries that are pretty delicious. And they are. Well, now you're just talking dirty to me. <laughs> Those The blackberries, I hate them about, say, 10 months out of the year. But for two months, they are very delicious. Um, but they do, they're... They're probably the worst in my eyes because they are, you know, they take over areas such as riparian management areas. So basically they take over stream sides and they take over road sides. So what they're doing when they take over those streams, stream banks, I mean, you can drive down our rivers and if it's not managed, you can just look and you can see blackberries everywhere. What that's doing is it's limiting wildlife's ability to get down to the stream and drink water luckily on the oregon coast water not really a limiting factor but for salmon salmonids steelhead it's just taking up a ton of habitat that's habitat that would normally be uh normally be salmon berry which just you know not just as prickly but still prickly still annoying hate to have to walk through it however a lot better for salmon and those smolt, they sit in there, and that would be habitat that they could hide under, hide from prey. But it's all prickly berries now. They can't get in there. And the tides change. It goes up and down. And that used to be where they would forage. That's their, when it, in the high tide, they'd be able to go out in the flatter parts and hunt for prey. But now it's just all, it's, blackberry grows very thick. It's really good at keeping anything else out. It's really good at expanding. I mean, it. It has no predators. Luckily, trailing blackberry is similar to it, so deer, they'll pick at it, but they don't really, they're not going to do enough damage. The only thing that's really going to eat blackberries, the whole plant, goats. And Goats? Yeah, goats eat anything. Goats will eat blackberries, they'll eat poison oak. They're going to eat whatever you put in front of them. So maybe we introduce some sterile goats into the land and uh, let them live for a few years and die out because they're sterile, but... Maybe cult the land a little bit. No, because uh, goats eat everything. So what you have to do is you have to put them with a spike where you want them to eat. Now, it'd be pretty easy to just keep spiking them, moving them down the riverfront. But you can't let them roam free because goats eat whatever's easiest because they're goats. And uh, so most of the time, they're not going to want to eat something covered in spines. They're going to go eat the grass that the cows are trying to eat, which are grazing right beyond that. Why don't we make it like a deal for any goat shepherds like hey free uh free roaming and uh uh for and free food for your goats but they have to eat blackberry well you are running into a lot of red tape now there's two answer to this question private landowners will pay people to have their goats come in and eat their poison oak or blackberries oh so this is already being done well, yeah, but now you're. Here's what I don't think you understand about being out west. All right, all right, all right. no, I I know Half I hate the... red tape, and I know there's gonna be red tape. So let me just prepare yep. myself for there's red being... tape. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> all right, give me the bad news. Half the land, half the land out here is owned by the federal government. I just got made a sad face. That was the bad news. I and now the... I'm just picturing books upon books of legal documents of what i can and can't do so here's i'll break it down for you the good and the bad news is the good news is most of these land managers who work for the federal government they know that the right thing to do is try and get rid of these invasive species by whatever is necessary and the bad news is it seems like they are so constricted by red tape that they can't really do anything which is where we're at now. We had a guy come in and talk about like how the the talk about the salmon and steelhead population and about how their habitats being destroyed by the blackberries and we don't know how to get rid of the blackberries and I told him it'd be it was not get rid of the blackberries but restore the riparian areas or 
stream areas to what they naturally were. And I told him a pretty easy solution, but it involved herbicides and prescribed fire. Both of those things, the federal government's going to say no on nine times out of ten. And they're very great land management tools because fire is the original herbicide. I mean, it's we've been people, not we, people of all races, whatever, have been using fire to control land since before, probably even before recorded history. Listen, I'm a pyromaniac. You sold me. I heard fire and I, I was sold. Like you, you, you just made it sweeter by saying we've been doing it for a long time and it's effective. He, he, control burning sure give me a, give, give me a flamethrower give me give me give me a blowtorch and some lamps what are those uh lamps you told me about that you guys use for control burning you're talking about drip torches drip so torches drip torches yes. have a mix of diesel and gasoline and it allows it to burn and be different firing patterns of where your lighters are standing you can control different aspects of your burn but what I'm saying is, so burning out here, uh, most riparian areas or stream beds are comprised primarily of 80-year-old Douglas fir or other conifers, which is what I was told by the um, the OSU guy who came to talk to us about what it used to look like. And uh, the problem is right now it's a lot of OSU, Oregon State University. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. We have we have schools out here too. Uh well, are they real schools though? Ooh. No, so you're good. Um, what I was saying is, the problem is there's a lot of uh, alders right now, and that's because of the way this land is managed in the past. All this land out here has been harvested by humans uh, before we had any legislation about logging and all this stuff back when you know everyone moved west. But we didn't know any better at the time, and we can't hold that against them. But the problem is right now, it's hard to fix the mistakes of the past because it's dictated by legislation that we can't do certain things. So it doesn't make monetary sense to do those things. Now, it makes sense if you're a private organization whose only goal is to restore the environment. But if you're a private landowner, you're a cattle rancher, you're you know, you own land, you own timber land and your objective is to make money and that's how you survive, you're not going to do those things because it doesn't make monetary sense. Maybe that's right, not right, maybe that's wrong, but at the end of the day, everyone needs to eat and every human's going to put their welfare above pretty much anything else. I mean, that's just the way it is. Humans want to survive. It's just human nature. You're not going to put your family in a hole for some fish <laughs> yes. as much as as much as i love fishing i'm not going to go in debt to restore some fish that i may not even see the outcome of the benefit of the habitat restoration that's the thing about natural resources is it is a very long-term investment you're going to make your investment now you're going to pay for it now you're not going to see the torrents for another 30 40 years definitely generational at definitely least generational but that's that's the this is why I like Texas. For those who don't know, I currently live in Texas. And yeah, we know because like every Texan, you had to tell us about it. Damn straight, son. Uh, but a big thing that's affecting the South, including Texas, are feral hogs. And it's just open game. There is not a lot of red tape for feral hogs. It is war on all fronts. And it feral hogs, I'm not sh- sure how they became i don't know if they were normal pigs that got loose and become feral hogs or introduced feral hogs uh i'm not quite sure but i did i'm not entirely sure but i want to say they were brought over during like uh plantation southern uh, caribbean plantations for food on like ships bringing over goods from europe that would make sense but i do know is per year on average they cost the United States one point five billion with a B dollars. Jesus Christ. Feral hogs are nasty creatures. Uh they have at least they carry at least thirty diseases, nearly forty different types of parasites that can transfer to humans. The diseases also can go to cattle, 
domesticated pigs, sheep, goats, dogs, and they're extremely aggressive. They've been known to kill humans before, which is very scary. But I kind of like how some states are taking care of it. Like, uh, you can legally hunt wild pigs. I'm sorry, not wild pigs. Feral pigs in helicopters, hot air balloons, cars, 24-7, 365 days a year, as long as you're on private land with the owner's permission, et cetera, et cetera. But... It is still not making a dent, and these feral pigs are just moving north. Like, they are spreading far, and they are spreading fast. Like, um, an eight-month-old female can start breeding and can have two litters in about 12 to 18 months and can have about 12 piglets per litter. And for those listening, I highly encourage you to look up a map at the spread of feral pigs. It is... It looks like a zombie apocalypse of just spreading all across the United States. They've been as far west as Colorado and as far north as Michigan. And Nick, I know you're kind of an avid hunter. Have you ever hunted feral pigs? No, um, but I did want to say as far as zombie apocalypse goes, that's your best case scenario. They're fun to kill and they can't kill you as easily as zombies can. Um, I did want to add, though. The U.S. general estimate of total indirect cost of invasive species, $143 billion with a B. <laughs> so that would be control costs, production losses, loss of natural stocks, damage to infrastructure, damage to livestock, all that stuff. So this is a pretty serious, uh, pretty serious issue. Christ, that's so much money. That's so much money. One, four, three, billion billion dollars now i guess to be fair that's adjusted to two thousand eight dollars so i don't know how much that differs from two thousand twenty dollars but that's where we're at that being said i am ready to shoot them from a helicopter oh you'll like you'll like colorado then because colorado had the problem with feral hogs and in colorado they said you know what we're just gonna solve this problem and we're gonna solve it now Cornell, Colorado, they have completely eradicated their state of all feral hogs. Their method to do so was open season hunting, no permits, no license needed, day or night, with any legal hunting method, archery, muzzle loaders, rifles, etc., to hunt, kill, and remove the destructive feral hogs. And they did it. Apparently, they removed, they just had a giant open season war of remove the feral hogs. And it sort of worked. Yeah. Like I said earlier, it's like it needs to be quick and it needs to be extensive. I am. I might have also brought the point of property damage because I was when I was looking into feral hogs, I didn't realize that they weren't just eating stuff. They weren't just affecting natural wildlife, but they were running through fences, destroying fences. But they were also destroying tree saplings like they uproot and eat new trees being planted like their seeds. But they also rub their tusks and bodies against young trees and complete and destroy it. They are just decimating a huge part of the forest industry in the South. Yeah, not to mention that they go in and they uproot plantations of, you know, I'm not too familiar with agriculture down South. But what the pigs do is they go and they just destroy the soil. They pick at it and they kick it. And so you're getting rid of any seeds you have planted there and you're destroying your, you're compacting your soil, all that kind of stuff. They're just destroying everything. I mean, they're just destructive is what they are. You'll, you'll like this. Uh, so shout out to Cody Elrod. Uh, he has a job, Nick, I think might be up there for one of your dream jobs. His job, 365 days a year, is to walk around this land and property and simply kill and remove the feral hogs that's it yeah i mean that's a pretty good job um any i know a lot of people who work for a ranch or something and their job is to take a shotgun with them on their normal day of work and kill any invasive birds or something that eats a seed it's you know in, invasive species is a pretty big driver i mean out here in oregon like i mentioned previously pike minnows they uh you can get paid to catch pike minnows and you can return them for a bounty and some of them have a tag in them. People make over a hundred thousand a year catching these pike minnows, and I always wanted to make my life—you know—I wanted to make my living fishing. 
don't know if that's quite it yet, but uh, you know, it's a good start. I'm I'm happy you brought that to my. I did not know like it was that lucrative for that type of fishing. But what I come to realize is there's so much job potential to have for industries to make invasive species task groups simply to hunt and kill now there are some already and they are doing wonderful work shout out to them uh maybe not you nick we we don't really like you uh shout out to private industry getting it done (laughs) hey there are some good government ones too like park rangers and uh animal conservatives and stuff like that but it it's a huge industry that could produce a lot of jobs because as soon as one invasive species eradicated I guarantee you there'll be a new one right around the corner. And for those who are thinking that killing is a little bit inhumane and not the solution, I I I like crazy ideas trying to figure out a solution. If I had a magic wand, what I would do, like the robot drones to electrocute fish. But when it comes to some species like the feral hogs or the methane pythons, it's the only way that I can find because... They don't really have uh, feral pigs in the south. Don't really have any predators. There's no both no birth control that works on feral hogs. And for the pythons, they're just the apex predators of this whole new land that no one can touch them besides humans. And the only way you can't just pick them all up, put them on a plane, and drop them back off to their home country because it'll overrun their ecosystem and just make it horrible. So sometimes humanely killing and removing is the only way to go, and I fully support that. Well, that's what I said earlier, is that with these various species, it's not going to be something that everyone's going to agree with, but it needs to be quick and needs to be extensive. Even the thing that we haven't touched on yet is invasive diseases. Um, For example... Uh, the shoot, chestnut blight wiped out all American chestnuts save one island. One island somewhere in the Great Lakes, undisclosed location. No one knows where it's at. The only remaining American chestnuts alive. We lost all that chestnut genetic diversity except for that one island because they're saved because the disease can't spread that far. I did not know that. That is scary. Yeah. I mean, people brought it over from, it's a, another, I believe it's an Asian, Asian chestnut blight, brought it over. Now, here's here's the cool thing, which we'll touch on in later podcasts. So, there's two ways to combat this chestnut blight. And one, we've been working on for a long time. So, we've been breeding American chestnuts with Asian chestnuts. And after, and we've been continually breeding them together so that what we're looking for, we're selectively breeding chestnuts that exhibit the American chestnut phenotype or physical characteristics of American chestnut with the genotype or genetic characteristics of Asian chestnut, which is resistant to the chestnut blight, so that we can reintroduce it to our landscape. I mean, it's been absent from our landscape for a hundred years. So all the species that relied on it are gone now. I mean, hopefully the thought is we can bring them back if we reintroduce the chestnut, that things will start to return to what they were. But this is this is this is the funny but sad part, depending on what party you affiliate with. So these guys who have been breeding this, I mean, they're on their 15th, I believe, generation, which means they've been working on this for years, like probably 50 years breeding these chestnuts. Well, some people figured out with CRISPR, they can just take a rust-resistant gene from wheat, put it into American chestnut, and boom, good to go. It took two years to figure that out for them. I mean, they probably worked on it for longer than that, but, and now that American chestnut, 100%, or so 99.9% American chestnut genes, good to go back into the ecosystem versus been the American Japanese or American Asian chestnut hybrid, which has been worked on for a lot of years, which is still shares traits from both chestnut families, almost ready to go back in the environment after however many years. I mean, that is great news for New England uh, ecology, 
terrible news for those guys working on bringing that chestnut back by breed, selective breeding. Oh, I would have been so salty. I would have been so salty. Like, hey, my entire professional life of breeding these trees so we could bring them back to, to put them back to the world where they won't be affected by this disease. Oh, you did it in two years? Oh, oh, I can't, I can't even imagine that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly the time frame it took them, but a lot shorter. And, I mean, that's got to suck. I mean, that's people devoted their entire life to it. I mean, that's that's a long project. I mean, we selectively breed Douglas firs for the traits that we want, and we figured out a thing that we could do it quicker, and it still takes us 15 or so years to do one generation. We're on like our third or fourth generation of selective breeding of Douglas fir corn, which has a one-year growth or cycle. It's on its 116th of commercial selective breeding. I mean... We are, forestry is, I mean, we're so far behind agriculture, but yeah, it's, uh, man, can you imagine? I, I can't. Uh, And I'm thinking partly is, uh, a topic we sort of touched on was funding. I don't know how well your section up there is funded, but I imagine it could definitely be better. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. We, we can do, we can manage our invasive species what would help us more on funding is if the government stepped in and did their part and took care of their invasive species. Because they are, you know, like we said earlier, red tape. They're so limited on what they can do. We can keep invasive species off our ground if it's not there. But we can't treat invasive species on government ground. They can do that. However, it takes them a long time to do it. And oftentimes... We are hindered by our neighboring to government property or public property, which is all of our property. It's our property that is spreading all these invasive species for the most part. And that is probably the most tragic part of this. I appreciate what you're all doing, but I really, I dislike that we're trying to maintain. I feel like we should try to solve and not just put a Band-Aid on it. And like, um, like pythons, like the pythons in Florida and that are affecting Georgia and other parts of the Caribbean, they, you can't maintain some things because eventually you're going to have a weird storm that's going to blow some seeds somewhere. I got, I just got to think we got to go all in and just remove permanently the invasive species. It's a lot easier to maintain than it is to fix. I, I understand that, but that's one thing I wish us humans were better at was being generational. Like, yeah, it's going to suck now, but later down the line, we'll be thankful we did it. Oh, stop talking dirty to me. So here's here's the problem is uh, out here west out west every other square mile is owned by the federal government for the most part. We can do our best. We can remove invasive species 100% on our land. However, if the landowner next to us, the federal government doesn't do anything, what's the point of spending all that money if it's just going to continue to move in because they don't treat anything because they're tied up in red tape? That's where a lot of our issues come from. Yeah, I was um I was hoping that would change a little bit. When I was doing research on this, I came across the NISC, the National Invasive Species Council. They were founded in 1999 by Bill Clinton, but they've been updated and they have a new plan uh, that came out in uh, 2016. And it just seems like a lot more legal talk. And I they said they're going to spend annually $120 billion to help fight invasive species i had a hard time tracking where all that money went now i saw some of it go towards removal of the fertile pigs the pythons the lionfish etc etc but it it just seems like maintaining not fixing the problem which was uh i it really it really bugs me as an engineer to know what the problem is have possible solutions which is not do them and it's really frustrating yeah it's uh that's that's the worst part is i go to work every day and i'm drive past all these all this land that i see scotch broom on and i see our land and we treat it for scotch broom and you know that even though we kill all our scotch broom our land directly next to us is producing a seed bank that's going to live at least another 50 years. Quick question. Were you just taking a piss or you're pouring water? I was, I was pouring a beer. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Oh, well, there are some good news. Like uh, going back to Florida, I, Florida to me has been a fascinating chaos of invasive species. I didn't like. I knew pythons were bad in Florida. I didn't realize that they pretty much have won in Florida already. They've already. This is a study in 2012, so the numbers are probably worse now. A study in 2012 showed that they had reduced the populations of raccoons 99.3 percent, possums 98.3 percent, bobcats 87.5 percent, and marsh rabbits and foxes. They say are effectively gone. They pretty much just removed five native species within. What, uh, two, three decades. I believe the pythons were introduced in the 90s or 80s. You'll you'll appreciate this, Nick. This will make you feel uh, this will make you feel happy. So the reason why there are invasive pythons all in Florida and the South and part of the Caribbean is people flew them in on purpose to sell them at pet stores and conventions and exotic pets, etc. And then a lot of people, when they got bored or the python got too big, they simply let it go into the wild. And now you have a big problem. Look, if if there's one thing humans are good at, it's uh, taking blame for things they've done. So that doesn't surprise me. Oh, <laughs> uh, You ever heard the quote of why hell is a bottomless pit? <laughs> no, what's that? Uh, so the reason why hell is a bottomless pit, because a dumb motherfucker like you could always make it worse. <laughs> I believe it, <laughs> and I, I, I think Jordan Peterson said that, or so, someone said that, and I absolutely love it. But when doing research into pythons, like they become so big, even alligators don't touch them or eat them. And females can lay up to fifty to a hundred eggs, and there are tens of thousands of pythons already in here yeah well that's that's the thing that one of the things that i brought up earlier is that uh, a lot of the the common characteristic characteristic that a lot of these invasive species have is they reproduce quickly so they have once they release their egg or seed out release their seed or anything it's there's going to be a lot of them same with these pythons like you're saying is that they're going to release a lot of eggs I completely agree. That was a very common thing I kept seeing was they kept adapting to, they adapted the climate very well, no natural predators, and just the their birth rate or recycle rate was just so much higher than anything around that area. Yeah, that's a, that's a big problem because, you know, a lot of these people, these plants come over, animals, pigs, whatever they are, they come over. And if you can outbreed and you can, you're, offspring can survive growing to maturity then you're pretty much there like you're set and that's all you need and once you get once you breed and then reproduce and those offspring reproduce and if no one's killed them since then you're pretty much set in that environment and you're nothing's really going to stop you numbers always win if there's enough numbers but i want to do a shout out to the uh, florida fish and wildlife conservation commission Boy, that's a mouthful. Or uh, better known as the FWC, which me, they just said, all right, no more licenses, no more permits on 25 different public lands or private property. Just go at it. Just have fun. No, don't, don't worry about it. We don't worry about the permits anymore. And like you said, uh, some people make livings off of it. They've been uh, encouraging people to do it, and they've been incentivizing people to use m- with money to solve this problem yeah i mean i know someone in florida who's killed a hog with a knife just because he wanted to see if he could do it so it's uh you know it's florida they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do and we can't control that but at least let them focus their florida energy on killing those hogs over whatever else the florida man's doing i don't recommend doing it with a knife i feel I feel like that was almost a Darwin Award kind of moment because that felt... Hey, he he survived and he's engaged. Congratulations, Henry. Well, anyhow, Florida is not recommending people use a knife to kill hogs or pythons. Well, sort of using knives on pythons. They They have a brochure on their website on the proper way to kill these pythons. Like cut off their head, smash their skull in. They're trying to do it quickly and humanely, but... 
a lot of them are just capture and then euthanize and stuff like that. Now that that is American. The, you'll like this because uh, we haven't talked about this, but I know you know some stuff about it. They've been using a lot of Judas snakes, and for those who don't know what a Judas animal is, is they usually sterilize the animal, or they put a tracker in the animal, or they just simply follow the animal, let it loose in the wild, let it track it, let it bring it to the other t- species of its type. So you can eliminate and kill whatever species that is. And it has been very effective with pythons in Florida. So for pythons, at least these pythons, the Burmese pythons, the female to male ratio is very vastly different. There are way more males than there are females. So a lot of them are being, females are being captured, put a tracker in them, and then release. Because for those unfamiliar with snake mating, uh, it's kind of like an orgy, I guess is the best way to... to describe it is no go ahead use scientific terms mike okay well in this snake orgy where everything's <laughs> slippery and long they uh they kind of ball up together uh i know for gardener snakes because that's uh, the snake to grew up with sometimes they get knots and they'll die because they're all knotted together and they can't escape it's similar they just a bunch of males one female and they're just entangling each other trying to mate but they track the female find all the males, and remove it. They stopped doing it with females, and they've been only doing it with males because they are they realize the females don't work once they uh, neuter it. So they they use the males now to be Judas snakes to find the females and males because the females are the far more sought-after ones. Like they uh, Speaking of more prizes in Florida for hunting, they had a big, big python hunt uh, not too long ago to hunt these, and... You get more money for the size of it and whether if it's a female or not. I think for every foot on the snake was like an extra hundred dollars or something like that. It was a lot of it was quite a lot of money per snake. And it's it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, financial incentives are probably the only thing that's going to get uh, people going after them. And then, you know, people have tried different things. You know, I'd, I'd really like to see, you know, it's got to start on the individual level. I'd like to see people promoting indigenous species in their yards instead of planting kentucky bluegrass everywhere i mean i don't think we need to see any more grasses but it'd do a hell of a lot for the community to see some natural grasses some shrubs and forbs that are meant to be there i mean that would be it completely transform what america would look like but man i mean can you imagine what that would do to the environment i mean we're you're bringing the natural environment back to however many more acres i mean if even 10% of the private landowners in the U.S. transform their yards back into native-only vegetation. I mean, what, that would be a tremendous increase in habitat for all these animals, which would bring back, you know, it'd provide more habitat for native animals. Yes, maybe also invasive, but right now we're trying to bring back that native habitat. Nature is so beautiful and comes in so many different forms. And if we could bring back nature how it was before humans brought invasive species over or unseen circumstances change the environment in which that ecosystem is it would be so beautiful to see like a sunrise on a natural native habitat that that the ecosystem is in harmony i would love to see that without invasive species ruining that or changing wildlife see see how nature's supposed to be before humans got involved We're wrapping up at this point. We want to say thank you for listening to the first episode of Backyard Philosophy. You can check out part two of Invasive Species in episode two, which is out now. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Twitter.